This is Hatchet Chapter 2, and this is Part 2 for today's reading, and I'm starting on page 20 right in the middle. All so hopeless. He tried to figure out the dials again. He thought he might know which was speed. It was a lighted number that read 160, but he did not know if that was actual miles an hour or kilometers or if it just meant how fast the plane was moving through the air and not over the ground. He knew airspeed was different from ground speed, but not by how much. Parts of books he'd read about flying came to him, how wings worked, how the propeller pulled the plane through the sky, simple things that wouldn't help him now. Nothing could help him now. An hour passed. He picked up the headset and tried again. It was, he knew, in the end, all he had. But there was no answer. He felt like a prisoner kept in a small cell that was hurtling through the sky at what he thought to be 160 miles per hour, headed he didn't know where, just headed somewhere until there it was. Until what? Until he ran out of fuel. When the plane ran out of fuel, it would go down. Period. Or he could pull the throttle out and make it go down now. He had seen the pilot push the throttle in to release to increase speed. If he pulled the throttle back out, the engine would slow down and the plane would go down. Those were his choices. He could wait for the plane to run out of gas and fall, or he could push the throttle in and make it happen sooner. If he waited for the plane to run out of fuel, he would go farther, but he did not know which way he was moving. When the pilot had jerked, he had moved the plane, but Brian could not remember how much of it had come back to its original course. Since he did not know the original course anyway, and could only guess at which display might be the compass, the one reading 342, he did not know where he had been or where he was going, so it didn't make much difference if he went down now or waited. Everything in him rebelled against stopping the engine and falling now. He had a vague feeling that he was wrong to keep heading that he was wrong to keep heading as the plane was heading, a feeling that he might be going off in the wrong direction, but he could not bring himself to stop the engine and fall. Now he was safe, or safer than if he went down. The plane was flying, he was still breathing. When the engine stopped, he would go down. So he left the plane running, holding altitude, and kept trying the radio. He worked out a system. Every ten minutes, by the small clock built into the dashboard, he tried to radio with the simple message, I need help. Is there anybody listening to me? In the times between transmissions, he tried to prepare himself for what he knew was coming. When he ran out of fuel, the plane would start down. He guessed that without the propeller pulling, he would have to push the nose down to keep the, fl the plane flying. He thought he may have read that somewhere, or it just came to him. Either way, it made sense. He would have to push the nose down to keep flying speed, and then, just before he hit, he would have to pull the nose back up to slow the plane as much as possible. It all made sense. Glide down, then slow the plane, and hit. Hit. He would have to find a clearing as he went down. The problem with that was that he hadn't seen one clearing since they'd started flying over the forest. Some swamps, but they had trees scattered through them. No roads, no trails, no clearing. Just lakes. And it came to him that he would have to use a lake for landing. If he went down in the trees, he was certain to die. The trees would tear up the plane to pieces as it went into them. He would have to come down in a lake. No, on the edge of a lake. He would have to come down near the edge of a lake and try to slow the plane as much as possible just before he hit the water. Easy to say, he thought. Hard to do. Easy say, 
hard do. Easy say, hard do. It became a chant that beat with the engine. Easy say, hard do. Impossible to do. He repeated the radio call 17 times at 10 minute intervals, working on what he could do between transmissions. Once more, he reached over to the pilot and touched him on the face. But the skin was cold, hard cold, death cold. And Brian turned back to the dashboard. He did what he could do, tightened his seatbelt, positioned himself, rehearsed mentally again and again what his procedure was, would be, should be. When the plane ran out of gas, he would hold the nose down and head for the nearest lake and try to fly the plane and try to fly the plane kind of into the water. That's how he thought of it. Kind of fly the plane into the water. And just before it hit, he would pull back on the wheel and slow the plane to rede reduce the impact. Over and over, his mind ran, ran the picture of how it would go. The plane running out of gas, flying the plane onto the water, the crash from pictures he'd seen on television. He tried to visualize it. He tried to be ready. But between the 17th and 18th radio transmissions, without warning, the engine coughed, roared violently for a second, and died. There was a sudden silence, cut only by the sound of the windmilling propeller and the wind passed the cockpit. Brian pushed the nose of the plane down and threw up. Oh. Now, isn't that a good place to stop reading for the day? <laughs> so we've left, left Brian Robeson up in the air, doesn't know how to fly the airplane. Oh, well... That'll keep you on the edge of your seats until chapter three. See ya.